uh, it's been ages since we started this thing, and it's only like two days ago. Um, so this is um, a session that, that we'll refer back, I guess, to many of the other sessions. This is one is on improvisation, playing by ear. And um, we've talked about uh, intuition, we've talked about complexity, we've talked, and the, the discussion yesterday about complexity did, in a way, end in, uh, well, how do we deal with this stuff? And, of course, that was a nice bridge to, to, to telling people yesterday, well, that's on the agenda for tomorrow, which is about improvisation, you know, one of the m most important ways of dealing with situations that you can't fully grasp. Um, it's one of the reasons why, why you know, I said Stein, I'm, I'm Dick Reichen, I'm the director of Stein. Uh, one of the reasons why we say that improvisation is an important theme is, is, is not only because uh, many, many people that come to Stein, that work at Stein, that work with us, are into it. They, you know, they improvise in, 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 in with their music or with their performances, with their theater. Uh, but also because we think it's, um, and this is also something that came from the discussion yesterday. It's something that we may be able to bring to society. You know, even if, if you look at our society, uh, many of our systems, many of the things we do, are have become so complex that they're out of control. We don't really know how things work anymore. You know, many of the systems that we live in are so complex that we can't even try to understand them. You know, they can't be understood. It's not that we're not smart enough. It's not that we need to think longer. No, 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 no. Um, they cannot be understood. We have to act inside systems, inside lives that we can't fully grasp. You know, we, we, should, we have to give up in a way, this whole modernist idea of wanting to be in control of everything, wanting to be able to plan everything. And if you look at, at politics, for instance, there's still a very strong urge to control things. You know, if something goes wrong, there's always somebody who says, you know, we have to make sure this does never happen again. And risks are taboo. And, 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 and mistakes shall not be made, cannot be made. You know, we'll, we'll, we try to organize things so that mistakes can't be made. And um, maybe it's time for our society as well to start improvising more, to sort of take this whole idea seriously and that improvisation isn't just this wacky thing that musicians do and other artists or, or this thing that you do once you're at, your, you know, at the end of your wits, but it's, it's something, it's a valid approach to dealing with, uh, with complex issues. So, that issue, so that's why we have this panel, which is a combination of people from the arts world and people from uh, other domains. Um, a while ago, I read an interesting book called The, the Improvisatie Maatschappij, The Improvisation Society, by uh, the author Hans Boutelier, who had originally uh, confirmed that he would be here as a speaker, but he got involved in a, no, I don't think a major, but a minor accident with his bicycle, involving his bicycle and, and a car. So I'm very sorry to tell you that he's not here. We do, however, uh, have Ton Korve, who is a, a, a very fierce critic of Hans's approach. So <laughs> but he will talk about the same issues. <laughs> what exactly his criticism is, you know, Ton will tell you, to tell you himself. Um, but we'll start off the program with Ton, and, uh, who's going to talk about improvisation in, in a more general sense. Um, then we'll have Marcel Kobusen and uh, Sharon Stewart, who will, will also be, be talking about the concept of improvisation and demonstrating it. Uh, you will be improvising, right? We will all. You will, oh, we will all be improvising. Are you ready for this? Um, and then we'll have a break, and uh, then we'll have Rutger and Gerko uh, demoing stuff, and we'll end with David Toop. I'll introduce the, the speakers a bit more right before their talk, so... Uh, I hope you have a good morning. Um, Ton is my colleague, actually, at The Hague. Uh, my, my job at time is a half-time job, and the other half of my time I'm a, a lector, which is a sort of a professor at uh, The Hague University, and my, f my chair is called uh, Information Technology and Society. And uh, the work I do there <coughs> consists of working with a local library, an archive, 
and the, and, uh, and the museum in Gouda, which is a small Dutch town. And Ton is one of my colleagues at the school. He's a lector in human resources management. And uh, what we're trying to do is to look at how the practice of these organizations is changing under the influence of digitization. You know, what, what is a library in, in the digital age? What's an archive in the digital age? And the way we do it is quite deep. We really work inside those organizations. We don't just make nice, nifty demos and show them to people, but we really try to work with the people that work in these organizations, which is also interesting for our school, because our school is really very much a vocational institution. We have many courses that uh, are all geared towards training professionals, so we're really looking at how professional practice is changing, and pretty much all the work we do in Gouda is a, a lot of improvisation, so I guess uh, that's what, what Ton and I have in common there. And I've asked him to talk about uh, the more social aspects of, of improvisation and, and how they relate to larger issues in, in society. So, Tom, can I ask you to speak? Tom Corp. Well, that's a good welcome. Thank you. Um, when I was asked to uh, replace Hans Boutelier, the author of uh, the book called The Improvisation Society, I felt compelled to, uh, well, let me say, I felt compelled to improvise. Um, one reason that I had to improvise is that by trade I'm an economist, and whatever econ uh, economics is about, um, it's mainly about theology, I think, um, they don't like improvisation. The usual quip is that sociologists um, explain choice away and economics is all about choice. But, and that is a reference to theology, um, economists all tell us that unless we compete up to the limits of our abilities, um, we will vanish in the competitive uh, struggle um, in uh, society. Um, so we have sort of fallen from grace, and the more we uh, seem able to, to choose, the more we are um, invited to choose the one best way, and um, that one best way is the only way if one wants to survive. That doesn't allow for real choice, and it doesn't allow uh, for improvisation. So coming from there to here um, has been some sort of a leap. The other reason that I um, had to compromise was that, um, uh, well, I am going to talk a bit about improvisation, but I'm not going to talk about the improvisation society. And um, I have two and a half reasons for that. Uh, first is that society, for me, is not some sort of an envelope that explains how people behave. Society is often used in that way. For example, one refers to one's social class or social status, and then it um, is presumed to, to be uh, obvious um, uh, why someone did what um, he or she uh, did. Um, I don't think that is true uh, uh, at all. Society doesn't explain anything, in my view. It is not the explanance, it is the explanandum. It is the thing that has to be explained. And in that, I completely agree and that's the only point I think I will ever agree with her, but I completely agree with Mr. Mr. Thatcher, who denied the very existence of society. The agreement is um, not total. Uh, according to Mr. Thatcher, it is only people that act, and not societies that act. But I believe that next to people, things act. And um, so therefore, people and things should be included in any social uh, explanation of whatever happens. And things matter more and more, especially in our present day and age uh, of uh, intelligent computers that not just execute something that we ask them to do, but that have an own memory, that have their own feedback loops, um, uh, that are better than I am uh, in uh, solving puzzles of fuzzy logic and so, and so forth and, uh, uh, and so on. So that's one thing. 
Society is not an envelope. The second reason I don't want to discuss um, uh, society is um, that I um, look for um, the social in the type of associations that people make with other people and with things. Society, if it exists at all, uh, if it exists at all, should be uh, looked for in the associations and not uh, in uh, some sort of an environment. Um, so that's the second reason, and the second and a half reason is that there is no association without closure. And um, since I do not believe at all in the solution for closure that Hans gave, which is a closure by professions, by professionals, by professionalism, I will skip uh, that one reference also. And I will try and present another type of closure, the one represented by uh, that famous uh, uh, author uh, Ashby um, on what he called a requisite variety. We'll come to that. I have often used the words of improvising and uh, improvisation. And uh, just as often I never questioned um, what it meant. Making do is one of the... I try to, making do, for this lecture has been a great stumbling for me, going one way, leaving it, trying something new. Um, so I was on the path of mental associations and trying to find some sort of reference point where um, uh, it would, could become a whole. And next to just making do, uh, it is also using the unexpected. And of course, that is what Im improvisation really means. Um, uh, it is looking at the unforeseen, the unexpected. And to be precise, the unexpected inspired me a little bit more than just making do. Um, you might say that in the vein, and pardon the, the, the expression because it is much too grand, uh, but it is in the vein of Keith Jarrett's solo improvisation. And since we're there, we um, might think of jazz. In my somewhat distant past, um, I like to listen to jazz. And last Saturday, my newspaper gave its readers a present, a book on Miles Davis and a compact disc of the same artists. It was The Birth of the Cool. It was a pleasure listening to it after what has been for a long uh, for a long time in my lifetime. <clears throat> and whenever one says jazz, one says improvisation. Even if you don't know anything about jazz, and I know very little about it, you know that jazz is about improvisation. One expects a melody and a basic harmony, and the rest is varying on one element, and even if the harmony is reversed, it respects what came before. That is what, indeed, improvisation is. The best of variations occur if the musicians reaches out, reach out to the public. Improvisation is an incomplete script calling for an active intervention of its users, narrowly or more broadly conceived. Now, jazz is play, and the gift accompanying the Saturday paper did more than revive my interest in jazz. By the way, the paper claimed that what I got was a re-release of a Blue Note recording. That was a mistake. The original recording was on Capitol Records. Nevertheless, it rekindled my interest in plain playing, and by the same token, and somewhat stretched out, in playgrounds, in the places where people meet and can play. Playgrounds are, to stretch the jazz me metaphor a bit further, like jam sessions. Sessions where musicians gather and play out of the blue. An invitation for whomever is around and using whatever instruments are about. Like in a playground. Where children can play one game or another, depending on who there is, on who is willing to play, and on what toys are around, and also depending on the way the playground is laid out, is constructed. For example, in a mode that suggests and inspires, that asks for exploration 
and experiments. Instead of a mode that prescribes and determines. Not all playgrounds um, adhere to this standard, um, uh, especially not today's playgrounds, since these are strictly separated from the street and sometimes even uh, folding back uh, into the old mold of a club. One of the most famous playgrounds of the present architect, which was Aldo van Eyck, one of the greater architects of the uh, past century, um, was in the Van Boetselaarstraat in Amsterdam. Van, van Eyck gave us tens and tens and tens scores of playgrounds in the period shortly after the Second World War. Uh, and he devised most of those playgrounds uh, in such a manner that the distance from the street was not far. It was easy to um, sit on a bench uh, it was easy to cross borders, you might, uh, you might say. These playgrounds le leave a lot of improvisation. Today, if you go to the Van Boetselerstraat, you don't find the old playground again. There is a new playground, but it is organized in the form of a club where you have to become a member. And it is organized in such a way that the separation from the street is rather complete. You have to, to uh, 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 you have to do your best to enter, and you have to be a member in order to be able to play. The old open space uh, has disappeared. Van Eyck um, devised playgrounds that uh, do not separate play and street life, but playgrounds that integrate them. We had a lot of them in the city. Hardly any of, uh, of them is, uh, is, is, is left. Street life has gone, and with it, the border areas in which activities like shopping, talking, gathering together shade off into the worlds of play of children. We now don't have border areas, uh, areas anymore. We have borders. We separate instead of that we uh, allow uh, different activities, all belonging to a street, to a neighborhood, to a city, um, to fuse. We want them to separate uh, these days. As Van Eyck had it, and it was on the, on the, on the former slide, um, whatever space and time mean, place and occasion mean more. For, he said, Space in the image of man is place, and time in the image of man is occasion. And that, I believe, sums up the case for improvisation. To be a little more precise, improvising, in my perspective, is all about contingency. Dick mentioned complexity. I will not dwell on complexity. I will um, uh, I'd rather dwell on, on uh, contingency, and these are, of course, twin concepts. Contingency is, in, uh, is indeed coordinating uh, along the way, but in a specific sense. It is not at all like a plan B, like here. I'm drawing a contingency plan just in case. How would you like to, to drive? How would you like to drive the getaway car? That is not a contingency. That is a scenario for if something happens that you that might happen and that you can uh, uh, create decisions for in order to be able to act if it occurs, uh, even if you don't want it to uh, occur. But contingencies are not uh, uh, scenarios. First, contingency means that whatever there is could be different, could be otherwise. In this sense, it is a, a farewell to the old uh, idea of both engineers and economists of the one best way. And second, contingency is the very presence of the otherwise in the actual. You find that represented in the social meaning of art. For art is, as it once was called, the emancipation of contingency. It is the representation of the possible as actual and in the actual. An actual selection does not suppress other selections. It merely distances, distances, distances them 
and or postpones, postpones them. Like in the playgrounds of Van Eyck, where some possibilities were presented for playing, but it was not uh, um, uh, suppressing other modes of use by people in the street, going to shops, crossing at the playground, uh, taking a seat on a bench, and so on and so forth. The border between the actual and the possible is not a border. It is, as we saw, a border area, allowing for all kinds of traffic in the open <clears throat> or subdued, hidden, as a challenge to formal authority, as an experiment, and so on. In short, it calls for the art and practice of improvising. It calls for variety. Variety is the spice of life. It creates always more possibilities than we can handle, than we can cope with. So it needs some form of closure. And closure <clears throat> uh, is not self-evident. What variety? Well, like this. We have an incomplete picture. And we can play with it. And try to mold it into a certain shape. And people that look at such a picture, they try to... Um, complete the incomplete. And in doing so, if they do it together, they share options. And after the sharing of options, they um, go on and select the relevant varieties to continue with. It is like in design, where you often start with many people from many disciplines. You start, you might say, in a multidisciplinary mode. That allows you to share, share insights, share ideas, share concepts, share whatever. And only after the sharing, the people in design can come together again and try to select what is worthwhile um, going on with. Such sharing you might call the interdisciplinary. So from the multidisciplinary to the interdisciplinary, uh, progress in, in, in design. And if such uh, a continuance is, is chosen, then indeed the end result might be, uh, might be uh, a, a new design, uh, and um, then the whole circle can start again. It is, like in play and like uh, uh, in the playground, it is a form of what has been called learning by monitoring. It is a play of adapting and the play of changing uh, one's standards along the way. Like the, uh, uh, the play of children, uh, as, um, uh, as told to us by, by Johan Huizinga in his Homo Ludens. Children start with some rules, change those rules, devise new rules, adapt uh, the continuance of the play to their own needs, which may, in, of course, also include the needs of those participating. In that, they learn to cooperate, and they learn to look at standards and um, uh, change them. It is, um, therefore, a play of adapting and changing one's uh, standards. Um, as Isaac Stern had it, the more you practice, the more you raise your standards. And raising those standards um, by practicing is also a form of improvising. Improvising then is not about um, is not uh, some sort of a free for all. It is a form of self um, organizing. It is a form of um, self organizing that, of course, needs some some uh, some specific mode of of um, um, uh, pinpointing what is worthwhile going on with. And there are, uh, in the world of work, and that is my main um, uh, subject of, of study for many years now, um, it has been called closure by uh, requisite variety. And requisite variety is the end station of a series of uh, actions and happenings. First, it presupposes, like in the multidisciplinary mode, a sort of redundancy of functions. 
Now, redundancy, of course, is, is, uh, is a word that, that might um, uh, point at some slack, something extra. Uh, but the more, the more interesting part of it is uh, that it is also um, a, a reservoir of capacities uh, not always used and that could be used when one has indeed to improvise for something new. And then redundancy is not just slack, it is an essential ingredient in change, uh, uh, adaptation and uh, innovation. If, that has, if it is, uh, should be possible to come about, then the specifications of what a design should adhere to should not be laid out in advance. There's no blueprint, there's no, there's no, ground, uh, there's no ground plan, uh, and there are no um, uh, fixed routines to fall back on. They should be, those critical spe specifications should be minimal. They sh should uh, leave leeway, for example, for uh, discussing with clients, users, uh, and of course colleagues from uh, a whole strand of uh, functions elsewhere uh, in, in a group or in an organization. It includes also double loop learning, because double loop learning, of course, um, uh, points at uh, developing uh, and changing your own standards along the way. And that all ends up in requisite variety. And requisite variety is a very simple rule, and I want to, 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 um, uh, to finish with that. The rule of requisite variety is simply that only variety can destroy variety. Um, there is, of course, a lot of environmental uh, variety. There is a lot of variety uh, in, in things that you, that you might do. In fact, there are always more possibilities um, uh, than, uh, than one can use. And if one wants to, to cope uh, in an intelligent manner with that, um, one should also allow a variety, variety in competences, variety uh, um, uh, uh, of um, uh, disciplines uh, in coping with that uh, external variety. And that is what, what um, uh, uh, Ashby meant with the rule of requisite variety. If you want to cope with variety, you need a lot of variety yourself, within a team, within your organization, wherever uh, you're trying to, to, to get a grip on that. And without such requisite variety, um, improvising becomes a myth. And with such requisite variety, improvising becomes what uh, is now developing and uh, also is uh, called um, the new world of work new modes of work in which people from all places at all times can log in, can contact one another, can present their ideas, can select what is useful by, uh, for them. Uh, the selection is also made by them and then uh, try to develop new, uh, new things. For organizations, that is hard to swallow because organizations, of course, never started with sharing Organizations always started with their own selections, and only after that some, fo some form of sharing could, could come about. That order uh, is reversed, and that uh, reversal, well, one might call that um, improvisation. Thank you very much. Microphone. Yeah, okay. Are there any very specific questions for Tom? We'll have a general discussion on the whole issue uh, at the end of the of this session. But if there are specific questions about Tom's talk, now is the time to ask them. Okay. So are you also saying that I have one? Are you also saying that uh, it's better to improvise with a group than as an individual? Sorry. Is it better to improvise with a group or to, to deal with this requisite variety in a group than as an individual? Um, as far as I know, and taking the Gouda experiment as an instance, it is better uh, to improvise, improvise with a group. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, simply because um, uh, 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 we all have our own perspectives. We all use our scissors to chip out one part of the complexity that we think we can, we can, uh, we can cope with. Uh, it leaves out a lot of the contingencies that really make make uh, uh, improvising ex experimenting so uh, so uh, 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 so interesting. But of course, it can be done by oneself. I mean, uh, uh, we had a performer last night who was cutting out, you know, paper with scissors. Yeah, <laughs> on her own. <laughs> but go on. 
Well, I, I, I mean, if I take if I take uh, Keys Jarrett as an instance, uh, when Jarrett is playing, uh, uh, what he says is, "I'm always improving upon my standards. Uh, I'm making life more difficult for myself." But he's doing that by sort of excluding the public. There's no like like in some jam sessions, like in some jazz of, uh, forms of, of, of improvisation, there is uh, not not an invitation to to, to, to intervene and um, uh, for him um, uh, with and then it becomes a much gr uh, grander um, uh, um, uh, audience, um, so that he can follow upon that. Some jazz musicians, Winston Marsalis is, is I think the main instance, was constantly on on the lookout for such possibilities of including the public. Um, <laughs> And then, even on his own, he was not on his own. Jared is, is uh, I think, a fantastic form of, of uh, uh, self-improvisation, uh, solo improvisations, uh, and, and therefore leaving out. So it can be done. And um, um, uh, I'm not an expert on, 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 on the issue of what is better. But I do believe that, that Keith Jared is sort of an exceptional phenomenon. He is not... Um, uh, uh, the the the, um, uh, the mean of the population. Well, I'm asking it because in our case it seems to become the mean. You know, if, I, I don't know if anybody's noticed who went to all the concerts. Pretty much everything you've seen, you know, were individual people. The one-man band thing is big here at the moment in our in our in our sector. So to say, <coughs> a lot of people, you know, come to Stein and they make instruments. Because they want to perform on their own. That's why I'm asking the question. It's 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 almost like a big trend in our in our field. Well, yes, but I mean, I I believe that that um, um, uh, on your own, if on your own includes the possibilities of things, yeah. then well, on your own become, becomes time, be, be, you know. becomes 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 a whole world, and then you get that form of association that I pointed to at the beginning. That is not just the associations of people. It is the associations of people and things. Uh, and then I believe that, that, that the, the idea of solo becomes a different idea. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks, Tom. Well, I, 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 I wanted to say our next speaker, but we have uh, speakers, Marcel and Sharon. And I said to Marcel, you're from, from Leiden University, right? And he said, well, yes, Leiden and what, Minnesota, Ghent, and, you know. Oh, you're not. What was the other one? Malmö. Oh, Malmö, Malmö, okay. Uh, I won't introduce a lot about them. Uh, they're going to make us all improvise, Sharon and, and, and Marcel, together. So the floor is all yours, guys. I'm going to, I think I... I don't remember what we decided. I'm going to stay seating, I think. Yeah. Okay. Hi. You're going to say one sentence, right? No, no, I'm not. No, okay. Thank you. So, um, out of curiosity, kind of break the ice. How many of you have um, been active or have come to other events the last two days? And the more crucial question for me is how many of you are here right now. <laughs> Very good, because I need all of you, um, including you on live stream or sense if you're not participating. And I'm going to ask you to become active participants doing something that's like a visualization, a meditation, a listening process. And I'm not sure if it's an improvisation, actually. Maybe that's not important. but. Um, it is kind of a risk because I'm dependent on all of you without being able to control you. Um, the title I've given it is Remapping the Body Space, Receptor, Digester, Responder. And it's involving your um, deep sensing inner body sense and the vibratory space of this room and the beautiful resonant voice of Marcel with <laughs> <laughs> his philosophical offerings. Um, this work draws upon, and I've kind of wrote it, I've never tried it out on people, I've tried it out on myself, so it's interesting. Um, but it draws on the three years I've been involved in deep lis listening, and with that I mean becoming also certified in particularly that um, philosophy and practice of Pauline Oliveros. 
I'll just mention a few things about her to kind of give you context. She's also an interesting person to look up. She was the first director of the Center for Contemporary Music that was formerly the Tape Music Center at Mills. Um, she's a director of the Center for Music Experiment during her 14 years tenure as professor of music at the University of California, San Diego. She now serves as distinguished research professor of music at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and composer residence at Mills College. She often improvises on her accordion. Perhaps she only improvises, yeah, improvises on her accordion. I don't know if she uses another instrument with, also with the expanded instrument system which is an electronic signal processing system that she designed, but maybe have more information. Um, she's the author of five books, Sounding the Margins, Collective Writings, 1992 to 2009, Initiation Dream, Software for People, The Roots of the Moment, and Deep Listening, a Composer Sound Practice. Um, so here we go. I mean, you can take off your shoes if you like. You don't have to, but it will augment the experience. <laughs> and I'm sorry, we're kind of in this kind of stage setting, which is horrible for this. Um, <laughs> yeah, don't take off your shoes if you don't really trust uh, experience. And so I'm going to ask you to do something that, again, is really difficult in this context, but you seem very gifted and that is to turn your um, awareness to inside your body, and sometimes it helps if you close your eyes. And um, what we are going to do is to actualize a radical morphing of our perceptual flows. So sound will be registered not only by the ears and digested by the brain, but this process will be now spread out through the entire body with three processing centers, which I will call digesters. Um, if you need a little more help to become motivated, imagine that we have become abducted by aliens. And in this holding chamber, they will, with our cooperation, rechannel our perceptual flows in a way that is crucial to our survival in the new environment. So this is going to involve our bodies, I'm sorry. We need to loosen the holding patterns of our bodies for this morphing to take place. So if you can, please sit more actively. That means not leaning back, more towards the front of your seat. You can feel your sit bones, the ischial tuberosities projecting the bottom of the pelvic girdle. And you can also move a little bit. We're trying to open up some space in the body so you can feel how it is to tilt forwards and backwards. We've all got our eyes shut, so it doesn't matter what you do. And you can deepen your breathing, and you can feel maybe more flow entering the body and more expansion. Flow between the organs under the ribs, in the pelvic and the shoulder girdle. Now I'd like to ask you to bring your attention to the enteric nervous system, otherwise known as the gut. Become sensitized to the electrical pulses, the intelligence that is there, the signals and activity. I'm going to turn, term this our lower digester, which is now capable of processing vibratory sound information. When this digester is activated, it should light up. This digester needs a means to receive sound so see if you can direct that same sensing down through your legs and feet. Sensing electrical activity down to the very sensitive soles of your feet, which might feel little twitches and pulsing. These are your antenna. 
and they are capable of transferring vibratory information. These are the receptors for the lower digester. When the connection is made between the receptor and digester, they should also light up. Now turn your attention to the neural activity of your heart. So we're kind of leaving the lower digestive receptor, although it should be more activated than it was. The sinoatrial node is sending regular electrical pulses to your heart, which is further regulated by the atrioventricular node. What I'm asking you to do is to pay attention to the electrical pulses, not necessarily the contraction of the heart. Pay attention to the intelligence that is there, the signals, the activity. This is now our middle digester, which is now also capable of processing vibratory sound information. This also needs some antenna, the receptors, so you might guess, allow that attention to flow through your shoulder girdle, down your arms, to the very sensitive palms of the hands. Those are your middle receptors, and now they're also capable of transferring vibratory information to the middle digester. When this happens, it should also light up. Very good. And now we're moving up to the um, upper digester. That would be the brain, the central nervous system, and the spinal cord cradled in the always flowing cerebrospinal fluid. See if you can actually sense the electrical pulses of your brain, not necessarily the thoughts, but the sensations of the brain. This is your upper digester, which is now become capable of processing vibratory sound information. It also needs an antenna. So imagine that um, in the crown of your head, the aliens have been conducting genetic recoding, which allows for the growth of about a one meter long pointed projection like the Cersei of crickets covered in vibration-scenting hairs. And then see if you can extend your sensing along this extremely sensitive antenna, the receptor for the upper digester. This is a more complicated morphing, but don't worry, it is reversible. So once that is upper receptor to your upper digester, that should also light up. And now I'm going to ask you to listen to Marcel in one of these modes, either the lower receptor and digester, the middle, or the upper. My uh, verbal interruption of this exercise is called Some Completely Needless Thoughts on Improvisation, Listening and Networks. And it will consist of three parts. First part, some thoughts on the significance of improvisation. Second part, some thoughts on listening. The third part, some thoughts on improvisation and the complexity of networks. Part one, some thoughts on the significance of improvisation. Why is improvisation important? Why should it, for instance, be taught, if that is possible at all? I will very briefly discuss three interconnected ideas. The first one, improvisation is the development of something new. 
At the end of Hannah Arendt's text entitled Labor, Work and Action from her book De Vita Activa, she writes, and I quote, without action, without a capacity to start something new, the life of man would be doomed. Action, with all its uncertainties, is like an ever-present reminder that men, though they must die, are not born in order to die, but in order to begin something new. With the creation of man, the principle of beginning came into the world. End quote. Arendt's reflection is not about improvisation in music. But each improviser, at least in the Western world, recognizes the necessity to produce something new, to begin again and again. Improvisation is beginning, is an endless starting, an infinite becoming, trying, groping. What this requires is an active forgetfulness. Improvisers need to forget in order to remember the new obscured by the old. In other words, improvisation is not so much about creating something absolutely new, rather it is the ability to find new ways of inhabiting old forms. Improvisation as a process of reappropriation. The second idea, improvisation as the acceptance of insecurity. Improvisation means to expose oneself. The possibility of failure is an intrinsic element of all improvised music. In the book Improv Wisdom, Don't Prepare, Just Show Up, Patricia Ryan Madsen writes that the systems we put in place to keep us secure are often keeping us from our more creative selves. Saying yes to the unknown and unforeseen will open up new worlds. Not knowing is perhaps even a precondition for any creative process. Improvising means affirming fear and saying yes to insecurity. Improviser and co-founder of the AMM Ensemble, Eddie Prevost, states that risk and doubt are two crucial tools for the improvising musicians. Music is perhaps a perfect field in which to experiment with these qualities. Third idea, improvisation as a space for music and social interaction. In Saying Something, Harvard professor Ingrid Monson writes that through the simultaneous interaction of musical sounds, people, and their musical and cultural histories, a moment of community can be established. There are not only musical instruments, pitches, or rhythms interacting, but also humans. During a performance, an interactive construction of music and the development of emotional bonds among musicians occur simultaneously. Monson specifies emotional bonds as risk, vulnerability and trust. In other words, in improvisation, the social and the musical fuse. According to Monson, talking interaction on stage Listening is a precondition for an adequate and respectful musical response. I could add here that being respectful could also take place in the process of non-listening. Keith Rowe describes his mindset during the recording of Duos for Doris, a CD he made with John Tilbury. I quote, I attempted not to actively listen to John's piano as my hand descended towards the guitar not necessarily listening to what he is playing, not reacting to his playing, but being affected by it. The act of non-listening is very important, preferring juxtaposition to confabulation." End quote. Rowe's attitude makes space for musical interactions that demand a responsibility the ability to respond, that is not already prescribed, a praxis of risk for which there can be no rules, no codes, no principles, no guarantees. 
non-listening as a research into the possibilities to interact on another level than the conscious, accepted, articulated, crystallized ones. Perhaps that is the difference between reacting and being affected, to which Rowe refers. So why is improvisation important? Why should it be taught, if that is possible at all? These three short ideas have shown that through musical improvisation, man encounters difference, the other, the inability to control everything. And that might be the main contribution of musical improvisation to the extra musical world. The space we are in is alive with its own characteristic hums and vibrations, as well as potential sympathetic vibrations. So turn your attention, please, to this space, remaining, seeking to remain in one of these modes or if you like, shifting between modes. We've mapped out new perceptual flows in the body, and with these we're mapping out the vibrational space, keeping an awareness of our internal sensations, our inner body space, while sensing the vibratory information transmitted by the room. At some point in this kind of listening meditation, Marcel will start speaking again. See if you can just broaden your attention to include the sound of his voice, receiving and digesting it, while listening, sensing, receiving the vibrations of your own inner space, as well as entire space, vibrational space of this room. to some thoughts on listening. <clears throat> In the other side of language, Italian philosopher Gemma Corradi Fiumara understands contemporary Western culture primarily as a culture in which speech or logocentrism is superior to silence and listening. Fiumara's alternative hinges on the possibility of freeing our thinking from this logocentrism by giving back to Western thought the other half of language, namely the rich openness of listening. Listening can be an important support to the effort of seeking to establish a relationship between our world and a different polyphonic world where different voices with various resonances and intonations can resound and reverberate. Although hardly addressed in her book, improvised music can contribute a great deal to the human capacity to listen, to listen to subordinated or unheard voices and sounds, to listen differently to everyday sounds, to listen attentively, cautiously and respectfully. This might even be one of the most significant contributions improvisation is able to make to our contemporary cultures. According to Ingrid Monson, once more, the main thing about interaction during an improvisation is the ab ability to respond and to anticipate to changing musical events. And she calls that the on ongoing process of decision making. That's why it is important to learn to listen. Monson calls this sensitivity toward other musicians. Musicians who miss opportunities to, re to respond are often said to be not listening. Listening means being able to respond to musical opportunities or to correct mistakes. 
listening, to listen carefully, with respect, attentively. However, this attentive listening should not only be understood in a more or less passive way, with dilated, dilated ears while being completely silent and fastened to a chair as during a concert of classical music. To listen carefully might even not only take place through the ears. Sometimes other parts of the body seem better equipped to register certain sonic events. The brain when dealing with ultrasounds, the stomach and guts when dealing with heavy bass sounds, and even the skin when dealing with high frequency crackling sounds. The physiology of hearing is very well researched today. The ear with the system behind it. The eardrum, hammer, anvil, cochlea, auditory nerve, etc. However, what is relatively new knowledge is that our whole body plays such a large role in the perception of sounds and noises. According to artistic research of Bernhard Leitner, one can determine precisely where a sound enters the human body through thermovision photography. Over a certain period of time, there is an increase of temperature in this area, just as the temperature of the entire of sound in it. So sound waves induce changes in our body. Leitner is not speaking here about the whole emotional dimension of sound, but just about the physical aspects when sound waves hit us, penetrate us, move within, within us. And all of this is unconscious. So every word that I, that I exchange with you here does the same thing. It penetrates into your body. It is not something directed at the brain. It is directed at the body. Listening is a bodily activity. <laughs> 